back. WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore positive. Yes, the Orioles are doing well, and it's baseball season around here. And obviously, the football and training camp's underway, and Luke is out in Owings Mills. We're doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour, presented by the Maryland Lottery, in conjunction with our friends at Goodwill and Window Nation, as well as our friends at the Restaurant Association of Maryland. But here in Baltimore, in the city, it's always basketball season. Anytime I get a chance to talk to this guy. Had Don Chaney on a couple weeks ago. A lot of folks doing a lot of good things in Baltimore, including Baltimore's own. Uh, yeah, I remember working at the News American when Kathy Frazier, I was just a kid, said, man, Muggsy, you got to see Muggsy play over at Dunbar. And the next thing you know, Wake Forest, and I'm down at the ACC tournament at the Capitol Center, and he's dribbling around. I'm sitting with the Wake Forest pet fan and a deacon. I think I can still hear the Demon Deacon uh, a pet <laughs> song all these years later. Muggsy is back. Obviously, you know about Muggsy, and, uh, the, but a book. And obviously the documentary almost a year ago now, I caught it. I was on a Raven strip late at night and it showed up on my television. I was, I might've been Cincinnati, wherever I was. And I sat and watched it. My life from a kid in the projects um, to the godfather of small ball. Uh, Muggsy is here standing tall as he always does <laughs> on the uh, Zoom. What's up, brother? How are you, man? Welcome home to Baltimore. It's always good to visit with you. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here with you as well. It's always good to be back at the city. Well, all right. So books, uh, telling life stories, all that stuff. I mean, dude, you were a life story, five foot, whatever you were in 1984. Uh, you had to, you know, you were always different. You always had a story to tell. I'm kind of shocked that this book didn't happen 15, 20 years ago. Tell me a little bit about putting this together and the documentary, because we talk about Lamar being one of one around here. Dude, you're the original one of one, really. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Yeah, well, I've done a book uh, back in 93, 94. So this is my second memoir. I did one that's called The End of the Line of Giants when my pops and my good friend Reggie Lewis had passed away. Um, and we kind of, it was the beginning of my uh, journey. And I think that was more or less uh, the story of that book. This one, uh, it, I waited a little longer. I'm turned, it's been over 20 years since it's been out. Um, but I wanted to put this one out mainly because of the generation gap, uh, mainly because it, the pandemic had happened and I wanted some positive vibes to be out there. I wanted kids and not only just kids, but people just have, you know, belief within themselves that they can overcome and, and, and whatever adversity that they face, that they can overcome that. It all takes just confidence within yourself. And some of the relationships also that I want to talk about with the players that I play with, some of the current players today, like the Steph Curry's and Chris Paul, any relationship, me and my wife have rekindled after being divorced after 10 years. Um, it, it's just a heartfelt book. Uh, I just wanted to, again, uh, share some of my journey, some of my story to give a behind the scene of what got me to the place that I am today. Well, man, I worked at the paper all of my childhood, right? From 84 to 86, I was at the News America. And then I went to the Sun from 86 to 92 through all of your collegiate, your draft, coming in, coming home and playing for the home team. Like all the things that happened to you, it all happened in this light. And unlike... Patrick Ewing or Bill, you know, Bill Russell, who we lost the other day, these giant men that stood above you, look and see them. You are the exact opposite in that way that you could sort of blend in to some degree. But everybody found the spotlight for you. I, I think for some people, they would say, hey, what's Muggsy up to? What's he been doing? And you mentioned divorces and marriages and being in Charlotte and making a life after basketball. How has that journey been for you? And I guess that that this book is an update on. You saw me as a kid, right? Now this is what happened after basketball. I mean, it was a, it's been a wonderful journey. No regrets whatsoever because all that I've gone through, it allowed me to be the individual that I am today. And I always believe that, you know, when you go through trials and tribulations and you're able to overcome some of the difficult times in life, it just makes you stronger. And my life and growing up in the inner city of Baltimore prepared me for, you know, that journey. Uh, and I'm so thankful that I had the people that were surrounding me, you know, the very few people that gave me that type of support that I needed to build, to continue to build my confidence, you know, that allowed me to continue to, uh, to navigate throughout, um, uh, throughout my journey and be able to see, you know, on the other side of what I felt like, you know, what I believed in, in terms of what my dreams and what my aspirations were. And I never wavered that. And that depends on what people thought or what they said. I never let my confidence waver. And that allowed me to continue in this journey. And it's just so grateful to be able to, to experience it all. Because, again, you know, being able to play the game of basketball and was fortunate enough to put me in a position where I was able to do some, some extraordinary things and be able to provide for my family. And in the meantime, 
being able to be successful in that regards, it allowed me to also look at other things in life that became more important, well, as opposed to giving back to the community. Well, uh, for, for you to have that opportunity, and I remember, I mean, we're almost the same age, and Bob Wade uh, putting a group of really special guys together to play basketball, but there were a lot of things that happened long before you got there that got you there, right? And, and especially Absolutely. on playgrounds where you are the smallest guy, and I know things are tough now, and the city's different at this point, but but people people looked after you, right? And people stepped up for you in a way that allowed that to happen, to, to give you an opportunity that I think a lot of folks don't get that opportunity in the modern era. Uh, there's a lot of resources in the city here that have deteriorated since your time, 40 years ago. Yeah, that's true. And the recreation center is one of them. Uh, recreation centers were mainly a safe haven for a lot of the kids there. They kept us out of that trouble. It allowed us to dream and visualize a, a place that where, you know, we thought could be a better place. And those was a big support and, you know, that was a big support for a lot of kids in that neighborhood. And uh, and just from having, you know, those older gentlemen understood that what our aspiration, what our dreams and, uh, and goals were, where they didn't, they kept us away from the negative part of uh, things that was happening in the city, which was the drugs and that sort of stuff. So, you know, those guys really been, were supportive and, and allowed us to not take part in, and that negativity and kept us on that path and that allow us you know to have not have that type of you know uh fear or that type of uh decision making which way we wanted to go um because we was getting that support and we wasn't being influenced to be you know do something that we know that we didn't want to do so having that type of support really allowed a kid really to grow in the inner city but i think you know the director at that center mr leon howell who i lost last week um, and, and who's going to be dearly missed. He really impacted so many. The hero in, in our community back then was Mr. Leon Howard. You know, Mr. Leon Howard really took a lot of kids under his wing and gave them vision, which we didn't think that existed. It started with a kid by the name of Skip Wise, Honey Dip Wise, and it went on always to Larry Gibson, the guys of Duke Richardson, Kevin Bush, Kevin Woods. Hey, I never saw Skip play. Did you? You saw Skip? Play. Oh, absolutely. I grew up in the neighborhood with Skip. Skip is still so, a good so, friend so of mine. The legend of Skip Wise is, you know, as large as any legend there's ever been on the playgrounds here. Look, larger than your legend to some degree because it never really. We saw what you did. We saw what we, you know, Russ. Everybody had a chance to. He he was different though. That he sort of the missing thing that we never got to see. All of no, that, we right? saw we saw Skip. We saw Skip, but we unfortunately got cut short um, based on some of the decision making things that was happening in his life. Uh, but Skip was one of the players that we 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 just. I mean, it was amazing just to see the way he had skills on the basketball court and he only had nine toes you know his big toe was, <laughs> was off he had nine toes we always tease him about that but he was our hero you know skip holiday wise to this day i love him to death because he was our hero he was the guy that really taught us how to be at that type of player that we wanted to be um how he carried himself even though i, I say that he had some negativity that happened in his life but for us we didn't see any of that. We just saw the positivities and the things that he did negatively, we learned from that. And he always taught us how to be able to stay away from the things that we didn't need to involve ourselves with. So we always gave Skip that type of roses and credit, you know, in terms of mentoring us and bringing us along. Along with, you know, my hero was Dwayne Wood, you know, a little kosher. Dwayne was only 5'5", five, five, who kind of played the game like a big man. I always get emotional when I talk about him. Um, he played the game like a big man, you know, and that was something that I kind of really start to believe that, man, this guy that size out there having this type of impact on the floor, man, I know I can play this game. And having seen it and believe it and stealing some of his little, you know, moves from him allowed me to be the player that I am. So I'm so thankful for the city of Baltimore and the people that really was there for me. And, and you know, I can't say much about, you know, Mr. Mr. Wade because Mr. Wade was – everything once we got to that point in our life you know once mr howard groomed us and taught us the way of how to conduct ourselves as a young man because many of us didn't have fathers in our household because mine got you know took kept taken away from me at the age of 12 and mr howard became that father figure for me so with his toolage and his understanding of the game allowed me to be the mugsy bows that i am today and without him it wouldn't have been me
Tyrone Muggsy Bogues is my guest. Uh, my life from a kid in the projects to the godfather of small ball. Talking about home. You mentioned Skip and Skip's problems. Yeah. And I, I, I want to tell a little tale about you and me. You inviting me into a party in Las Vegas <laughs> when the NBA was on strike. That I sat with you and Charles <laughs> Barkley for four hours. Charles picked up the tab. I tell people this all the time because crazy stuff's happened in my life. But but sitting in, you know, in, in the Rio in, in Vegas when the NBA's on strike after I left the World Series in San Diego to sit with you guys. But, I mean, temptations, just what I saw that evening in Las Vegas that you live with every night of your life to keep yourself on a straight and narrow when playing play days are over. I'm talking about taking care of your money, taking care of your body, taking care of your mind so that you're around to write a book all these years later. I think when, the, when you leave the game, even when you leave the game with money, you leave with problems, you leave with something missing, you know, that, that adulthood part of this. Man, you've made it totally to the other side of this, and I think to some degree – Maybe the mistakes made along the way and things you saw people in the league go in the wrong direction and all sorts of ways. It's there for you. The temptation never. It's not just what you learn on the streets of Baltimore in the 70s and early 80s. That goes your whole life, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's a learning curve throughout your whole life. You know, as you grow, you know, you take things as you move on and you. Yeah, I mean, the things that we learn early in our life, it prepares us you know, for the man that we are today. And I'm so grateful and thankful that I had those experiences at an early age, you know, and being from the city of Baltimore, you know, coming from the streets and having that street smarts and being able to also be able to get an education academically and putting them two together, it allows you to kind of navigate and see what's real and what's not. And I was never been one that was easily affluent. So having that understanding and knowing where I came from and I always told myself, you know, if I ever get in a position where I can be successful, I will never go backwards. And that was something that I always predicated myself to, you know, being able to pride myself, taking care of my money, being able to live a custom lifestyle the way that fits my style and my, my, my entire, you know, way of living. Um, and it's comfortable. So I, I never try to live beyond my means. You know, I stay within my lane and, and enjoy it to that you know, to the best of my ability. And that's something that I always understood moving forward. What do you do when you come back to Baltimore? I know you're, you're going to be grieving this time around when you come back with friends and stuff like that. But you come back here. I don't know how often you do. I know you're active. I, you know, we get together once in a while. First, first time on Zoom, we, you call in every couple of years. You're doing something here. What's important to you when you come back to Baltimore about where, what's become of Baltimore, its reputation to some degree. A lot of folks are working on it. A lot of local guys, I me, mean, Tori Smith, Aaron, maybe I, I can name names, but guys like you that are associated with Baltimore, I know it's important to you when you come back here. And it's important that we, we, we leave it better than we found it, which isn't always the case right now. Absolutely. And you mentioned some great names, Tori Smith. You know, I, I had an event up there last month for my sister. Um, where we continue to honor her legacy. She was a big part of Baltimore. She ran all the inner city programs, the BNBL, the projects of our the football leagues, all the youth programs for Park and Rec. So they are awarded her a proclamation day on June the 27th. So we honor that day every year. We had our fourth annual last year, I mean, this summer, um, due to COVID, um, post-COVID. So we was able to, to, to have it this year. Uh, we had a great turnout for the city. They really came out and supported uh, Tori was going to make it out, uh, but unfortunately he had to uh, spend a little time with his family um, because we had basketball and football tournaments going on that day for the kids and the city uh, park and rec has been so supportive in providing that resources for us to be able to have this to take place. And I'm so thankful for them. And we just, you know, I'm grateful. I always get to see what the city has, how far the city has grown and what program they continue to implement for the youth um, and also, I got my family there. You know, I got my grandson, my daughter, my granddaughter, um, as well as my brothers and my aunts and niece and nephews and all of them still there. So it's a good opportunity to go back and see family and, uh, and spend a lot of time with them. Dude, you're an icon for anyone. I mean, young kids don't know about you. You know, it's like you can do it. You can do it no matter how tall you are. You know, I mean, you can do it. And you're living proof of that. And I think that that story, that transcends anything about basketball or about sports, that you can do it, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, anyone, any human being should believe that they can do anything in life. And that's one of the messages I want them to always take from whatever they come in contact with me. You could be whoever you want to be. 
the only limitation is on you. You know, if you decided that you want to be the president, if you want to be the a doctor or whatever, you start preparing yourself to be that. And you let God, you know, put them at the forefront and then see where it goes from there. But the confidence within yourself is where it all starts. And that's something that I always preach is, and I always want to make sure every person I come in contact with, especially the youth, that they understand that that is the key within you. I don't want you to look in that mirror and see that reflection just like that reflection. I want you to love that reflection because that reflection is you. And that's who God created. And you have a gift. And hopefully you're able to find that gift and utilize it to the best of your ability. You're good with mugs, and not just because Charles picked up the uh, tab that night. And I, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you, you've, you've always thrilled us on the court. I appreciate what you're doing off the court. The bu- book is Mugsy, My Life, From a Kid in the Projects to the Godfather of Small Ball. And he stands tall and uh, forward by Steph Curry and Alonzo Mourning. And Steph Curry, man, right?